1993, there was a film um, called Searching for Bobby Fischer. I don't know if you ever saw it, but it's about a young, a young man, a young boy. Uh, it's based on a true story. Uh, uh, Josh uh, is a, uh, a master chess player. It continue, he, he is as well today, but he doesn't play chess like he did. And, um, and the Josh uh, Waitskin is his name, and the young boy in there is Max Palmer, Palmernack, who plays him in this film. And his father and, and Josh are walking through the park, and he sees these men playing chess. And he's fascinated by it. And no one knows, has any idea, that Josh is really a great chess player. He doesn't even know that, he, that he's a great chess player. But he goes home, and he goes underneath his bed, and he pulls out Legos and little people and so forth, and he actually builds a chess set from just from what he memorized, what he saw at, this, at, at the park. And he starts moving the pieces along the board, and his dad comes in and eventually sees him playing chess, and his wife says, well, you need to play Josh in a game of chess. And, of course, the dad thinks that he's going he's gonna to beat his, beat his uh, very, very young son. And all of a sudden, his son's beating his dad, who is a pretty, pretty good uh, accomplished chess player on, in his own right. So he decides what he wants for Josh is to take him to some, to some place where Number one, evaluated to see how good of a chess player he is. And number two, if he is a good chess player, to teach him the fundamentals of the game and possibly turning him into a champion if, if that's the case. Now, th this movie is more than about chess. If you haven't seen it, you really should, Searching for Bobby Fischer. It's a great movie showing a young man who has talent and sometimes parents end up driving their children to, to excel in a particular area. Uh, to the abandonment of everything else. And so it's a, it's a great, great story, one of a heart and so forth with this, this, young, this young man. And there's a particular scene uh, in the film that applies to what I want to deal with in these two talks. Um, ben Kingsley is the, the, the instructor of, of, uh, of Josh, and he's being paid by the hour by his father. And at one point in the film, Ben Kingsley wants Josh to look at the chessboard and to figure out the, how checkmate can take place in four moves. He has the board set up for a four-move checkmate. And he wants Josh to figure out those four moves in advance, not just one move at a time. And Josh says, I can't do that. He says, I need to move the pieces. And, um, this is, this is what Kingsley says. Clear the lines of lint in your head one at a time, and the king will be left standing alone like a guy on a street corner. Here, I'll make it easier for you. And what he does, he takes his arm and he, he sweeps all the chess pieces off the chessboard onto the floor. And there's 64 squares, and Josh is looking at a blank chessboard. And he says, I, he says, I can't do it. He says, you can. He says, I can't do it. He says, you can. And so sure enough, Josh looks at the board, and he, he figured it out within four moves how to checkmate, and he gives Ben Kingsley's character what that first move is. And that's what I want to deal with. I want to deal with sweeping the board clear, clear of eschatological talk because so much of eschatology, like all doctrines, is already set. The chess pieces are set and glued to the board. And you can't call those things into question because this is just what everyone believes, or we've been told this is what everyone believes, and this is fundamental to the Christian faith, all these particulars regarding eschatology. And so, uh, and I, I want to make it very clear that what I'm going to talk about today isn't anything new. Nothing that I'm, I'm going to say in these two talks is new. It may be new to you, but this isn't anything new. I'm, I'm no uh, innovator when it comes to, to what the Bible has to say. I'm more of a systematizer. I like to go through Scripture and try to figure out problems. I'm a problem solver. And when I was in, in uh, I became a Christian in 1973, I uh, had been introduced to Christ on the topic of eschatology, and 
back then, 1973, keep in mind, was uh, three years after The Late Great Planet Earth was published, a book that sold nearly 30 million copies in the 1970s. And in that particular book, uh, Hal Lindsey made a prediction. He would say he didn't make a prediction, it was more of a suggestion that everything was going to come to an end before 1988. Israel had become a nation again in 1948. Matthew chapter 24, verse 34 says, This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. A generation is 40 years. 1948 plus 40 gives you 1988. If you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, therefore the rapture could have taken place between 1981 and 1988. Uh, this is 2020. Uh, we're still here. Uh, and the question is, is that a biblical system? If it was that easy to make that kind of prediction, which he wasn't the only one who was making that prediction, uh, Chuck Smith did the same thing. But there are just a lot, there are a lot of eschatological points uh, uh, that are like pieces on a, on, on a chessboard that are glued down. And if you want to play the game of chess, if you want to play the game of esch eschatological chess, you've got to move your pieces around those permanent, those, you, those permanent pieces. And you, and you can't stray uh, from those. And that's just not the way uh, eschatology works, because so many of the doctrines that, that come out of modern-day eschatology are relatively new. And it doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's obvious that over the centuries people have questioned various things, and people have been predicting the end of the world for a very, very long time. So it isn't anything new. When it comes to postmillennialism, however, uh, there have been critics uh, especially when you uh, look at every, you know, anything from the, the late 19th century and all the way up through, of course, the 1980s, and even today, people making predictions about the end. And postmillennialism has been, I wouldn't say under attack, but it's simply dismissed. And I'll define millennial, these millennial issues. Um, so the prophetic chess game must be played around these immovable pieces. And what I want, to be, I want to show you is that these pieces are not immovable. They need to be challenged. They are really pawns that need to be set aside and taken off the board. But there have been cr critics of postmillennialism for a very long time. Um, a former professor of mine, Dr. Greg Bonson, wrote an article called The Prima Facie Acceptability of Postmillennialism that was written uh, in the 1976-1977 in the Journal of Christian Reconstruction Symposium on the Millennium. And he offers a short list of what some post-mill critics say about the acceptability of post-millennialism. Now, I want you to listen to these, and I want you to see if you notice how they're arguing against post-millennialism. And here's what Dr. Bonson uh, said. Now, Dr. Bonson, uh, Greg Bonson, was one of the most brilliant uh, Christian scholars of the 20th century. Uh, he died in 1995 uh, as a, after a... Uh, Valve replacement surgery was his third one. Uh, he was a professor of mine when I was at um, Reformed Theological Seminary. He, he was one of the, he d debated Gordon Stein in a debate called The Great Debate on Atheism. If you haven't heard it, you need to watch it. It's called The Great Debate with uh, Dr. Greg Bonson and Gordon Stein. It's fascinating, fascinating debate. Uh, Greg was uh, far above his uh, uh, peers in terms of apologetic methodology and tactics and so forth. But this is what he wrote in this article about the, what critics had to say about postmillennialism. Alva J. McLean says of postmillennialism, this optimistic theory of human progress had much of, of its own way for the uh, half century ending at World War I of 1914. After that, the foundations were badly shaken. Prop after prop went down until today the whole theory is under attack from every side. Devout postmillennialism has virtually disappeared. And this, that was written in 1956. J. Barton Payne, in his massive encyclopedia of biblical prophecy, mentions postmillennialism only once, and that merely in a footnote which parenthetically declares two world wars killed this optimism. Merrill F. Unger dismisses postmillennialism in short order, declaring this theory largely disproved by the progress of history, is practically a dead issue. John Walford tells us that in eschatology, the trend away from postmillennialism became almost a rout 
with the advent of World War II because it forced upon Christians a realistic appraisal of the decline of the church in power and influence. Hence, he says that in the 20th century, the course of history, progress in biblical studies, and the changing attitude of philosophy arrested its progress and brought about its apparent discard by all school, schools of theology. Postmillennialism is not a current issue in millenarianism. He accuses it of failing to fit the facts of current history, of being unrealistic, and of being outmoded and out of step. And, and Greg goes on with others, and he concludes with this statement by Hal Lindsey, the author of The Late Great Planet Earth, which came out in 1970. Um, he says, uh, Lindsey's book captures well the attitude of these previous writers, stating that there used to be a group called postmillennialists who were greatly disheartened by World War I and virtually wiped out by World War II. Lindsey's poorly researched conclusion is this. No, no self-respecting scholar who looks at the world conditions and the accelerating decline of Christian influence today is a post-millennialist. I mean, we might as well go home if those, what they're saying is true. Now, what did you notice about their argument? What were they using to justify their arguments against post-millennialism? They were using historical events. They were using the current events of the day. Now, Dr. Bonson described this as newspaper exegesis. Now, exegesis is, the ex ought to tell you, exegesis is to take out of Scripture what's there. Eisegesis is to put into Scripture what isn't there. So newspaper exegesis puts things into the Bible aren't there, that, that aren't there by taking the current events, the newspaper headlines, the what's on Facebook or, or what's, what's on Google, whatever the case might be today, and says, this is, this is the lens that we are looking for to evaluate the topic of any eschatological position. First Mussolini and then Hitler was the Antichrist. Barcodes and computer chips are the mark of the beast. Cobra helicopters are the locusts in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. I don't know if you've heard about that, but that was a big, big deal that Hal Lindsey in one of his books came out with in 1973. And here's what Lindsey said. I have a Christian friend. Remember, this is 1973. I don't even know if they have helicopter, uh, uh, Cobra helicopters anymore. But he says, I have a Christian friend who was a Green Beret in Vietnam. When he first read this chapter, he said, and the chapter is uh, Revelation 9, verses 1 through 12. I know, that, I know what those are. I've seen hundreds of them in Vietnam. They're Cobra helicopters. That may be conjecture, but it does give you something to think about. A Cobra helicopter does fit the sound of many chariots. My friend believes that, 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 that the means of torment will be kind of nerve gas sprayed upon its out of its tail. Now, that's newspaper exegesis. And the problem with this is Cobra helicopters. This was Vietnam. This was uh, 50 years ago. And so something else comes on the scene later on, and you, you're back to the newspaper again, and what, what's the new thing that this could be? It's a real problem. What is the best way, really the only way, to interpret Scripture? Scripture interprets Scripture. So when you go through the book of Revelation, and you find some of these things related to locusts, where, what do you do? You don't go to the newspaper. You go back to the Bible, and you see how locusts are used, sometimes literally and sometimes figuratively. You don't, you don't read the Bible through current events. Now, of course, what happens is that uh, you know, today, anything that takes, that's taking place today is considered uh, significant regarding the end times. Here's another one, John Walvoord's book, Armageddon, Oil, and the Middle East Crisis, which was first published in 1974. And it was repeatedly updated as historical events came about. So finally, the final, the final edition is this. Now, notice the difference. I'm going to give you the original title. Armageddon, Oil, and the Middle East Crisis. Now, in the 1970s, 1972, 73, and 74, we had an oil crisis. So that was, that was the newspaper headline. So now we want, to read, we want to read the Bible through the oil crisis. But we're not having an oil crisis today. We're, we're, in fact, we have too much oil. So now they've changed the title of the, the new edition, Armageddon, Oil, and Terror. 
what the Bible says about the future. So you see what happens when current events change, the, the interpretation of the Bible changes. So imagine what newspaper exegesis would have been like in the first century. Peter and others were beaten and thrown in prison. Stephen was martyred. Saul ravaged the church in Jerusalem, entering house after house and dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. James, the brother of John, was executed by one of the Herods. Some Jews took an oath to kill Paul in Acts chapter 23. Paul describes in his second letter to the Corinthians all the anti, what would have been considered anti-post-mill things that happened to him nearly 2,000 years ago. Let me read a couple of them to you. This is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He's having to defend his apostleship. And he talks about that he had been uh, beaten numerous times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, <laughs> dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers from false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, apart from such external things. There, are, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without me being weak? Who is, who is led in, um, into sin without my intense concern? If uh, critics of postmillennialism would look at that and say, postmillennialism can't be true. Now, they wouldn't have named it that, but the advance of the kingdom throughout history and, and the gospel success couldn't be possibly true after reading things like this. But looking back over 2,000 years, you know, we, my wife and I were on a, a, a 40th anniversary cr a, a cruise a number of years ago and from Athens to Barcelona and spent a lot of time in Greece and we spent a lot of time in Italy and we went to Rome. I mean, Greece and Rome were the greatest empires that the world had ever seen. They're tourist attractions today. Who would have ever thought that in the, in the first century, uh, after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, and after what you read in the book of Acts, I mean, read, the book of Acts is a description of, of the persecution that took place uh, among Christians, and then, of course, later history, and, we, and then what happened with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And you look at that and said, who could have ever imagined that the gospel would have had, had the impact on the world that it, it has had? Now, are lots of bad things happening in the culture today? Yes, absolutely. Um, but remember, we had the bubonic plague. We had the Black Death. Uh, we had world wars. I mean, you can go on down the list on all this. People talk about, well, the, the great number of earthquakes that we're, that we're having, and we'll talk a little bit about that about later. And so, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 the sun's, you know, turning red and so forth. All of these, all of these supposed end time events are being packaged once again, like they were packaged in the 1970s, like they were packaged in the 1940s, like they were packaged in the early part of the 20th century. Yeah, the, the French Revolution in the 18th century, the Russian Revolution at the early part of the 20th century here. All of these were packaged as a, as a defense for we're living in the end times. Everything that the Bible predicted about this is true. The post-millennialist says absolutely not. That is not what the Bible teaches about these things. And there is a way to explain all these things, and I'll get into that in the second, in the second talk. And by the way, those of you who are listening to this, uh, uh, this outline that I have here will be made available uh, with these talks. And so you can just sit back and relax uh, I've got it all written out here with all the footnotes and everything else. So we have to look at what Scripture says about a particular uh, topic, and in, that includes eschatology. We should not permit world conditions to be an indicator of what, how the Bible should be, uh, should be um, uh, interpreted. So apply the historical criticisms of the, of the above post-mill critics that I read from Dr. Bonson to 2,000 years of history, if their historical logic is sound, there should have been a steady decline of Christianity from day one. 
I, I debated, uh, Gary North and I debated uh, Dave Hunt and Thomas Ice back in 1988. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar who Dave Hunt is or Thomas Ice, it really doesn't matter, but they were two prominent dispensational writers, uh, end time advocates. Uh, uh, Thomas Ice is still alive, I've debated him I think nine times, debated uh, uh, Dave Hunt quite a few times as well. He wrote a book called The Seduction of Christianity, and Peter Lightheart and I wrote a response to it called um, of the reduction of Christianity. And so we had this debate, and in that debate, Dave Hunt made that particular point about how the world was getting, you know, Bible teaches that the world gets worse and worse over time. I said, wait a minute, David, this is 1988, and what we read in the book of Acts, things should have just kind of completely gone down here for, the, you know, for nearly 2,000 years, but they didn't. Uh, if, if you read the Constitution of the United States, and it's I'm not saying it's a Christian document, but read the Constitution right underneath uh, uh, George Washington's signature, and it says, done in the year of our Lord, 1,787. Uh, wh what is that? We, we have named, we have, de we have de defined our calendar in terms of the birth of Christ. Now, the seculars have changed that with... Um, BCE and CE, you know, before the Common Era and the Common Era, uh, but, but that's a recognition that Christianity s established our civilization, and what we're seeing is that the drum beat against it. And we'll look at some, comp uh, some passages uh, that, that deal with this and to show you that as unbelieving thought becomes more and more consistent with itself, it it's self-destructs. When you, when you start uh, putting into law protections regarding the killing of the unborn, you start putting into law that homosexuality is a, is a right and transgenderism is a right. I want you to think about those actions. Those things are destroyers of civilization, destroyers of culture. As they become more and more consistent with those things, they begin to collapse. Postmillennialist comes along and says, what we should be doing is building Christendom in the areas in which we have influence and, and, and be transformational like we used to be. But again, more about that. I'm sure some of our other speakers will be addressing that as well. Let's, let's look at briefly the uh, main millennial positions because uh, it'll be important for what I'm, going to, what I'm going to address. First, premillennialism. The prefix tells you something about the timing of the millennium. Premillennialism, premillennialists teach that Jesus returns before the thousand years of Revelation chapter 20. Premillennialism. Uh, the millennium is uh, based upon the thousand years in Revelation 20. Now, here's, the pro here's the problem with that view. The premillennialist says Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem, sit on David's throne, a, a, another temple is going to be rebuilt. Animal sacrifices will take place. This is the dispensational variety of all this. It's going to be a period of peace and affluence and so forth and so forth on, based upon what we read in Revelation chapter 20. But there is no mention of an earthly reign of Jesus Christ, a rebuilt temple, the institution of animal sacrifices, the establishment of the throne of David on earth, the unconditional land promises made to Abraham from Genesis 15, the apostles reigning on thrones in Jerusalem, restoring the kingdom to Israel, and the promise that Israel will be restored. You can read the Revelation chapter 20 from the first verse to the last verse, and you won't find any of those items in Revelation chapter 20. But that is their system. And, and in addition, there is no mention of some of the commonest features of premillennialism, the luxuriant superabundance of Earth's produce, the animal world's mutual con, uh, conciliation and peaceful submission to mankind, increased human longevity, a rebuilt Jerusalem, the servitude of the nations, and the return of the ten tribes. The only reference to any earthly conditions during the millennium concerns the inability of the serpent to deceive the nations to gather them for the final battle. So this particular author says all of the things that actually define premillennialism, and now not all premillennialists would accept all of these things, but dispensationalists typically do, and they're the mo probably the most um, a popular position today. Yet, if you read Revelation 20, you won't find any of those things in there. It's amazing 
that a defense of that particular position based upon literalism is rather remarkable when the very things that you need to define premillennialism or your millennial position aren't found in Revelation 20, the only chapter in the Bible that mentions a thousand year reign. Now, given what we do not find in Revelation 20, the following cannot be supported as a true statement. And this is, this is a, a, a premillennialist. Interpreting Revelation 20 according to an honest application of the literary, historical, grammatical method, which conserv conservative evangelicalism largely adopts today, yields a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth after his second coming and the first resurrection preceding the final judgment. And yet Revelation 20 doesn't say anything about Jesus reigning on the earth. It's amazing. It's amazing. And yet, if you were to, uh, if, if you were then to sit down with a premillennialist and ask him what, how you deal with that, he would say, oh, all of these things come from other parts of Scripture. And, of course, many of them try to make that particular case. But you, one would think that your particular doctrine would be actually found in the one chapter where you are named after, that is premillennialism, Jesus coming, dispensational premillennialism has Jesus coming you know, for his church and then with his church at the end of a seven year period and then reigning on the earth for a thousand years. Uh, I went back to the early church fathers. Uh, Frank, Frank Gummerlock and I wrote a book, The Early Church and the End of the World. And I wanted to see, because I've always heard that the early church fathers, uh, most of them were premillennial. And as I did my study, I found hardly any who were premillennial. And the ones who would be considered premillennial did not use Revelation 20 in order to support their position. I'll give you an example. Here's the example. The days will come in which vines shall grow, each having 10,000 branches, and each branch 10,000 twigs, and each uh, true uh, twig 10,000 shoots, and each one of the shoots 10,000 clusters, and on every one of the clusters 10,000 grapes, and every grape when pressed will give 5 and 20 uh, meters, about 10 gallons each, of wine. And that, that was, that's how the defense of, the, of, the, uh, of so-called premillennialism uh, pre is often used by these early church fathers. They're not quoting Revelation chapter 20 in order to make their case. They're bringing in things from, from somewhere else. So that's premillennialism. And there are varieties of premillennialism. There's dispensational premillennialism, and there's classic or classical premillennialism. Classical premillennialism does not hold to, to many of the things that dispensationalists hold to, but they still believe that Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. The amillennialist. The amillennialist, uh, the awe means without or no millennium. And in essence, they're correct. If you look at Revelation 20, it does not describe a millennium. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So amillennialism does not teach that Jesus will physically reign on the earth for a thousand years. Like most post-millennialists, all millennialists believe the thousand years is symbolic of Jesus reigning from heaven throughout the church age until the second coming. But so both all millennialists and post-millennialists believe that Jesus is presently reigning and the thousand years is a symbolic period of time for a long period of time. And I held, I held that position for the longest time. And then as I started to read more about how the number thousand is used in scripture, and, and, other, and other studies that I did that I, I left all millennialism and became a post-millennialist. Um, uh, but one of the things that all millennialists have, uh, believe is very similar to premillennialism. And I'm going to quote a, another former professor of mine, Dr. Robert Strong, who wrote the following in the Presbyterian Guardian. This was in 1942. All millennialism agrees with premillennialism that the scriptures do not promise the conversion of the world through the preaching of the gospel. And then here's one more by William E. Cox, uh, who wrote a book called All Millennialism Today. Uh, Pre-mills pre, uh, pre believe the world is growing increasingly worse and that it will be at its very worst when Jesus returns. All mills agree with the post uh, pre-mills on this point. So all mills and pre-mills, uh, their millennial positions are pessimistic regarding the future. Post-millennialism teaches that Jesus will return after 
the thousand years of Revelation chapter 20. And it is uh, synonymous with the kingdom established by Jesus. Um, so, and post-millennialists do believe that the gospel will impact the world enough where you could actually say that Jesus Christ is being honored throughout the world. And there were times in history when that was the case. Uh, and there are ebbs and flows in history regarding that. Uh, post-millennialists do not believe that there will be, well, I shouldn't say this. Post-millennialists do not believe that things get worse and worse and worse. Post-millennialists believe that over time, uh, as, as unbelieving thought becomes more consistent with itself, that there will be the embrace of the Christian, Christian religion. Now, but here's, the, here's the, key, the key point. Does Revelation 20, since all three positions are built on Revelation chapter 20, does Revelation 20 describe a millennium as the term is usually understood? That is, do any of the positions gain their support from Revelation chapter 20? We saw that, Reve that premillennialists don't. Uh, there's nothing within uh, Revelation 20 that supports any of the things that they believe should be taking place. Uh, all millennialists, they think it's a symbolic period of time, but like the premillennials, they believe things are going to get worse and worse as time goes on. So does Revelation, should we even use Revelation 20 to define any of the millennial positions? Now, some of my post-millennial friends may be real irritated with me after saying all that, because that's typically where we end up going. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched an old Western uh, when you'll see a, these... Uh, ruts in downtown after a rain. And what happens is, is the carts come in, basically the wheelbase is the same, and they go through first time in the mud, and they create a path, and then the next one comes in and creates a path, and the next one comes in and creates a path. And then after a period of time, the sun comes out and dries all that, and what, guess what happens? The next cart that comes in, it's forced into that path. And unless there's another rain and someone does something with a street, like pave it, it keeps happening over and over again. I believe that, that focusing on Revelation 20 is a mistake. Now, B.B. Warfield, who was a professor of theology at Princeton Theological Seminary from 1887 to 1921, 20, uh, he was probably the last conservative professor of systematic theology, brilliant, brilliant man. He wrote this, Nothing indeed seems to have been more common in all ages of the church than to frame an eschatological scheme from this passage, that is Revelation 20, imperfectly understood, and then to impose this scheme on the rest of Scripture with force and arms. That is, if you want to deal with eschatology, you've got to deal with Revelation 20. He says, that's just a mistake. And we'll see also that the same thing is true of the Antichrist. People said, this is what the Antichrist is, and yet when you look at the passages that actually deal with Antichrist, it doesn't fit the definition at all. But the word millennium is not found in the Bible. Um, and this is something to keep in mind as well. It's not a big deal that the word millennium is not found in the Bible. Uh, and um, it, the Latin word mile and anos uh, just means a thousand years. Uh, but the New Testament was written in Greek. And uh, the Greek word is kilia. And so, some, so someone can be a millenarian, believe in a thousand year reign, and someone can also be a kiliast. And if you look at some of the literature, you will find instead of them using the word millennium, they use, they use kiliism because that is the Greek word that's used. Uh, and the, the, the word uh, um, millennium really didn't come into fashion until about the, the 17th century. So we need to understand when we talk about the word millennium. Millennium means two things that aren't necessarily the same. A period of a thousand years, especially when calculated from the traditional date of the birth of Christ that includes marking an anniversary like the inauguration of a new millennium or the celebration of a city's founding. Millennium simply means a thousand years. And so when our calendar turned to 2001, we were in a new millennium. And that's why people born in a particular period of time are called millennials because they were born in between these two, from the 1980s to, you know, into the, 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 the 2000s. That is simply a definition of millennium. Anything that's a thousand years is a millennium. But we talk about millennialism, that's something completely different. 
The thousand years mentioned in Revelation 20 is said to be a time of gospel prosperity, relative peace and righteousness. Does Revelation describe this second definition of millennium? I don't believe it does. I, don't, I believe this, we should not go to Revelation 20 to build our millennial view. So what are these, what are these fixed chess pieces that anyone who wants to deal with eschatology has to deal with, especially if you're dealing with dispensational premillennialists. The rapture is a given that must fit within one of five different positions. There are five different rapture positions. The rapture simply is this, that the church is taken off the earth either before a seven-year period, partially in the middle of the seven-year period, right before the wrath of God is poured out, or after the seven-year period. There are five different rapture positions. So that's the pre-trib, mid-trib, partial rapture, pre-wrath, and post-trib. The pre-wrath is the newest one. Uh, supposedly the rapture of the church takes place right before God pours his wrath out. Here's the problem with this, with this idea of the rapture. There isn't a single verse in the Bible that teaches the church is taken off the earth before, in the middle of, or the end of a seven-year period. Even, even 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 don't include any of these things. There's no mention of a tribulation period. There's no mention about Jesus returning physically and reigning on the earth. All the elements necessary for all this are not found even in that particular passage. And there's some great debate as to just exactly what that passage is, is talking about. So the idea of the, of the rapture in a seven-year period is just not found in the Bible. So where do they get the seven-year period? The seven-year period is found in Daniel's prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And if you read Daniel chapter 9, you will see that it begins with Daniel counting the years. Remember, he was taken into captivity. We don't know how old he was at that particular per period of time. Uh, he, he actually excels in leadership in the kingdom, helps Nebuchadnezzar out. Uh, he's he's made, put in a leadership position. But by this time, by the time you get to chapter 9, he's, he's going through the prophecy of, of Jeremiah. And he's saying, hey, we're coming to the end of this. This, this time in captivity, this time in, in exile, is 70 years. And so the angel comes to him and gives him another prophecy in verses 24 through 27, and that's weeks of years, which comes out to 490 years. And all three, the pre-mills, the all-mills, and the post-mills, pretty much agree that this is 490 years. And it's divided up until there's the, the, the last seven. The last seven is divided up into two, three-and-a-half-year pieces. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this. I deal with this in, in my book, uh, Last Day's Madness. And, and some other books. But essentially, what, is, what the, 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 the premillennialists do, they stop the prophetic clock after the 69th week of years. They stop the prophetic clock at 483 years. They stop it during Jesus' ministry. And that we are supposedly now living in something called a parenthesis. We're living in a period of time that is not part of the prophecy clock. So the clock stopped at the end of the 483 years, which took you to the time of Christ. And it won't start back up again until the beginning of the 70th week of years, the last seven years. And that's when the rapture takes place. That's when supposedly the church is taken off the earth, so God can now deal with Israel again. Here's the problem. There is nothing in Daniel chapter 9 that tells us that there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. Remember, what started the chapter? What started the chapter was that Daniel is reading the prophecy in Jeremiah about the 70, 70 years of captivity. Was there a gap between the 69th and the 70th year of captivity? There wasn't. What if God had put a gap? What happens at the end of the 69 years and people are saying, hey, we only got one more year to go. And then the 70th year passes and someone said, maybe we miscalculate. Maybe it should have been instead of 365 360 days a year for a year, it should be 365 and a quarter days a year. And they, oh, it's going to be a couple more years now. And so finally, 10 years pass, 15 years pass. And they finally say, look, one of you prophets is going to have to talk to God. And God says, I didn't tell you this. 
It wasn't indicated in the text at all, but what I did is I put, an, I put a, uh, a parenthesis, I stopped the prophetic clock, your captivity, at the end of the 69th year, and it really is not going to pick up again uh, until sometime in the future, and I'm not going to tell you when it is. So really, right now, you're not in captivity even, you're, even though you're in captivity. There's no indication that there is a gap between the 69th and 70th week of years. Uh, Jesus was crucified in the middle of the 70th week, at the end of three and a half years, first three and a half years is his ministry. The next three and a half years takes you to the time that the, could have, it could be at the time of Stephen's death, and the gospel ends up going to the Gentiles, which we see codified when, when um, uh, Peter is in Joppa. And it's interesting, Peter is the New Testament Jonah. He is actually called what? Simon bar Jonah. Simon the son of Jonah, son of John. And he is in Joppa. What is significant about Joppa? Joppa is the place where Jonah wanted to escape the directive of God to take the gospel to the Ninevites. So Peter here is in the same spot. And what happens in the very next chapter? He gets this vision of what? This, this sheet coming down out of heaven with these unclean animals on it. And, it's, and God says, take, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten any unclean thing. And God says, don't call unclean what I call clean. And it's at that point that we see that the, the, the Gentiles are, are going to be grafted in. Well, we knew this before because the gospel of, of Luke, Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2, tell us prophecies from the book of Isaiah. The Gentiles were part of the deal. The Gentiles were always part of the deal. But it was to the Jew first. And then... To the nations. In fact, if you, if you uh, read uh, Matthew chapter 10, what does God do? He sends, he sends his disciples out and he sends them out and he says, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Well, what is that referring to? It's not talking about something in the distant future. It's talking about the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 before that generation passed away that we will find out about in Matthew 23 and 24. And so it was to the Jew first. They weren't supposed to go to anyone else outside of that. Now, there were uh, inklings of this with the, the, the Samaritan woman and, 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 and some others. But for the most part, Jesus' ministry was to the Jews, was to Israel. But when you get to the, 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 uh, the book of Acts, you find out that the, the, the nations are going to be grafted into an already existing Jewish ecclesia, Jewish church. So... Again, this is a biblical theology that we all should know and, and be aware of. Unfortunately, dispensationalists claim, oh, no, 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 what happens is the prophetic clock stopped and God's going to deal with Israel again. A completely different generation of people, a completely different generation of Jews who had nothing to do with rejecting Jesus as the promised Messiah. And what's going to happen to those Jews in the future, according to the dispensational view? Two-thirds of them are going to be slaughtered during the seven-year period, based upon Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. Again, I deal with that in a couple of, a couple of my, my books. Um, so, another one, one of the unmovable chess pieces is, is that there must be an end-time antichrist who rules the world. And dispensationalists claim that he makes and breaks a peace treaty with Israel. And where is that found? Back to, uh, back to Daniel chapter 9, verses uh, verses 24 through 27. There's no mention of an Antichrist in that, in that passage. And actually, when you read, you would think that the book of Revelation would, include, would have Antichrist written all over it. You know that the word Antichrist doesn't even appear in the book of Revelation? It appears in two of, of John's letters, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, and John chapter 2, uh, verse 22, and, and John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, and 2 John 7. And what is the biblical definition of Antichrist? The biblical definition of Antichrist is someone who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the biblical definition. It's a theological, religious definition. It is not a political definition. Who were the Antichrists? Probably the the, the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah, you find in the book of Revelation, it talks about the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2, 9, and, and again in Revelation 3, 9. These were, and you read the book of Acts, who are the antagonists against Paul and the church? It's unbelieving Jews. 
Who were the believers? Believing Jews. The first, the first members of the ecclesia, the first members of the church, were Jews. Where was the first church? It was in Jerusalem. It was the church that Paul, in fact, was ravaging and arresting people. And you can see that in um, Acts chapter 5, verse 11, and in Acts chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3. So this idea of the Antichrist ruling the world, that's just not what the definition of Antichrist is. In fact, if you, if you, um, if you read 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 8, Verse 18, it says, remember, John is writing this. I believe John is writing this before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. So whatever this Antichrist concept was, it was already happening in John's day. And look at verse 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And 2 second, uh, second John, 2nd second Epistle of John, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Have gone out. Notice, have gone out. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. This is an extremely important topic. In fact, I, I deal, I've, I've written a number of, of articles on the Antichrist, and I'll, I'll get books on the Antichrist. It's actually on the Antichrist, and they never mention these four passages. The, the passages that actually define the Antichrist, they don't even mention. They go everywhere else. I think... Uh, I think it was uh, Tim LaHaye said there are 22 references to the Antichrist in the Bible. Well, that's only if you don't really define the Antichrist according to the Bible. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these. The Gog, Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We're going to talk about that in the next session. Now, it's a prophecy based on Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 9. But that, prof that, is, that comes from Ezekiel chapter, chapters 38 and 39. But you will find Jezebel mentioned there. You will find uh, uh, Babylon. You will find Egypt mentioned. Uh, and um, you will find all types of Old Testament symbols used in the book of Revelation. And I believe that the, the Gog and Magog battle found in Revelation chapter 20 is, is a symbol for what took place in the Old Testament and what indeed happened in the lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But we'll talk about that next, uh, in the next session. Supposedly, there's going to be a rebuilt temple. Again, if you don't believe that there's going to be a rebuilt temple, then you're out of accord to much of popular prophecy writing today. And you can go through the, the, the New Testament, and you won't find a single verse that says anything about a rebuilt temple. And even those who advocate for a rebuilt temple will admit there's no verse in the New Testament that says there's going to be a rebuilt temple. But they need a rebuilt temple because they need the temple destroyed again. They claim the abomination of desolation must stand in the holy place, that is, in the newly rebuilt temple. But yet, if you read Matthew chapter 24, 15, and Jesus has his, that audience in mind that Jesus told, said the temple was going to be destroyed before the generation passed away, that particular temple says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. And then Luke 21 talks about when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, it's time to get out of town. I already mentioned it'll be the slaughter of a million of Jews, Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, and everything else in the Olivet Discourse. People will bring up all these things from the Olivet Discourse and say this is being fulfilled in our day, but we'll talk about that in the next session as well. The rise of a ten-nation common market. That was a big, big deal. Almost a hundred, a hundred years ago they were talking about that. You know how many are in the, com in, in the European Union right now? Forty-four. So now they changed it, you see. They changed it say, well, these, it's not nations anymore. It's uh, uh, regions. There will be 10 regions of these 44 nations. See, we're back to newspaper exegesis again. The sun and moon going dark and stars hitting the, hitting the earth, Matthew 24, 29. All this, this stellar phenomena that are taking place today, the, 
the blood moons and, and so forth and so on. And, and these are supposedly indications of, of the end. If you don't hold to those, these particular uh, end time views, then you're out of accord with what scripture has to say. Again, let me remind you, I'm not gonna, what I'm gonna deal with in this next session isn't anything new. The position that I advocate, that is the majority, if not all of these um, the prophetic warnings uh, were, were uh, to, to, in a, a description of events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, 